everyone. Welcome to Looking to the East. This is our once every two week show that's taking a look at what's going on in Asia and presenting that to the viewers and listeners of Think Tech. My name is Steve Zerker. Uh, I'm usually a guest on the show. Today I'm going to be the host. Uh, Jay will not be joining us. Uh, the topic of this particular show is the reaction of Asia to this point to the Biden victory. Um, of course, it's a, a great change that America will be going through uh, over the next few months as we transition from the Trump presidency to the Biden presidency. And as we've often done in this show, we take a look at how America is influencing uh, countries in Asia. It goes without saying that Asia plays very, very close attention to American politics because of the economic and military influence of the United States. Uh, my family, uh, my friends in here in Japan, oftentimes know more about the intricate details of what's going on in the American election than, than I do. It's quite remarkable. Um, so today we are joined by a very, very special guest. Uh, he's a fellow professor here at Kansai Gaidai. His name is uh, Mark Kogan. Uh, Mark is an Associate Professor of Peace and Conflict Studies at Kansai Gaida University. That's also uh, where I work as well. Um, I'm sitting in my office here. We're both in Osaka, which is the second largest city in Japan. Mark specializes in peace building, human rights, democratization, social movements, and his strong focus is Thailand and Cambodia, which I'm sure will come up uh, as we talk today. Before he became a professor, he had a very interesting career. Uh, with the United Nations, working in Africa, Central Asia, the Middle East, as a communications specialist, focusing on climate change, uh, AIDS, anti-corruption, women political empowerment. So he's still involved actually with the United Nations uh, now that he's been a professor here for the last few years. He holds two graduate degrees in international conflict management and two degrees in political science and psychology. So Mark, thank you so much for taking time thank you to very much. Uh, join us today. And you know, we had our colleague Paul Scott on about a month or so ago. I was oh, gathering. Great. Yeah, it went quite well. It was uh, his impressions uh, of uh, the American election sitting in Paris, France, mm. and, and what he views Europe's response is uh, to the election. That was before the election actually occurred. Ah, I see. So uh, I wanted to try and bring you in because your focus is uh, more on Asia to get to what you think is the response, at least initially, uh, to the election. So Melissa, if we can throw up the, uh, the one graphic that I <clears throat> had sent to you. This graphic is an overview of the worldwide response. There, oh, you can see it now. Um, so the countries in red are the countries that have not acknowledged the Biden victory and the, Vi the Biden eventuality of becoming president in January. So we can see in the Asia region, uh, some very influential countries such as China and Russia. Russia, I'm not so surprised. China, I'm a little bit surprised. But also Vietnam <clears throat> and Cambodia. And uh, you can see the red countries in other areas, like in South America, uh, Brazil, no surprise there since their leader is uh, very similar to Trump in terms of his political strategy and politi polit political action. But anyway, we're focusing on Asia. So you can see India has acknowledged the election. Australia, New Zealand, of course, have done that. But there are parts of Asia that are still not acknowledging the Biden victory. <clears throat> I'm not quite sure why they're doing that. Maybe, Mark, you have some ideas about that, uh, why they're, they're being hesitant. Because even though Trump has not conceded, it's pretty much, I think, a given that Biden will be president in January next year. So Mark, just at a very high level, so I, I think that the, the, the first thing is that uh, you, you cannot neglect the internal audiences, not just the external audiences. So for example, uh, with uh, Cambodia, who has not uh, yet uh, acknowledged the, the, the Biden win, I think that's more uh, of an internal audience and a dismissal of the United States in general. Um, that has mm. been a... Uh, uh, a key strategy or a, a key kind of foreign policy uh, uh, narrative uh, with Cambodia. I, I will say that, that you know, not everyone uh, in Southeast Asia, at least, are cheering uh, Biden's victory. 
Um, a lot of them, particularly uh, Vietnam, uh, Trump is a very, very popular figure because of his willingness uh, to take on China. Um, and um, the, the others, I think, are on the fence. So, for example, Thailand uh, has a, a kind of strategy of what they call bending with the wind, or it's sort of like bamboo that bends with the wind a little bit. So they're a, a, um, a strategic power for both um, the United States and China, and they sort of balance um, um, politically uh, their, their foreign policies to, to sort of match the, the relationships with both countries. Uh, Thailand has had a historic relationship or a special relationship with uh, uh, the United States for many, many years. Uh, the United States was a strong backer of military regimes in Thailand uh, in the 1950s and 1960s because of uh, its reputation as sort of a, a beachhead against communism. Um, and um, it continues today, but with the arising, and actually we shouldn't, we shouldn't say rising China anymore. We should just say China has risen. Uh, <laughs> right? yeah, they have arrived. <laughs> They've arrived a long time ago. It, it, it's yeah, interesting that lag like between it. how much for how much farther they have to rise. I, I, I don't. Know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I no. guess when they become the number one economy in the world, then then oh, then maybe the Western world will say, okay, in, they're in there. Terms of, in terms of in terms of being um, a regional power and uh, a dominant power in Southeast Asia and the the Indo Pacific region, uh, you cannot dispute the fact that China has already risen. Uh, and you, you also uh, look at its uh, GDP or its sort of uh, total domestic output. Uh, it's significant. I can't call it a rising power anymore. So the 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 reaction to the Biden win, I, I, I would just summarize it by by saying that um, sometimes the reaction is for internal audiences as much as it is for an external audience for for the chinese they, the chinese uh basically already acknowledged uh biden's victory uh, uh, that is um perhaps uh, political gamesmanship uh I, I don't know how to read those particular tea leaves uh sort of uh, rubbing it in so to speak uh, uh to uh, president trump a little bit but um uh, the Reaction is not as important as um, the kinds of potential changes that it might see for Southeast Asia and, and broader uh, uh, Indo-Pacific. Okay, let me, let me put you on hold there, Mark, because I'm very interested in your view of what the potential changes would be. But to your point about China's growing influence, uh, one of the quotes I got when I was doing research on this was from Malaysia, which I guess would be one of those countries that has increased its reliance and increased its relationship with China. So the quote that I got from there was that basically Malaysia has kind of in a sense because of the lack of activity, lack of leadership over the last four years, has, has written the United States off to some extent and is saying that even with the Biden victory, the U.S. time is over, that it's a new world. So what do you think about that? It's kind of like what you were saying uh, with Vietnam, which has increased its connection with China and maybe now sees that it doesn't need to be so reliant or dependent on the American market, for example, or American leadership. Even though Vietnam, I, I mean, Vietnam and China historically have hated each other, but I guess given the current context, Vietnam and maybe Malaysia and other countries, because we've had this vacuum for four years, now are recognizing that it's best for us to partner more closely with China. Do you, do you think that that is something that's being discussed in the region and is acknowledged in the region, not just by these countries, but by others as well? Okay, so first, let's, take, let's first, let's take Malaysia. Uh, Malaysia is uh, um, a little bit of a difficult case um, because of its um, uh, connections to ASEAN, its connections to China in terms of trade. Uh, and the, the, the trend over the last 20 years, Ed, is that, that China's market uh, for Malaysian exports, for Thai exports, for Cambodian exports is only is only increasing, and the, the sort of the connectivity to to European and Western markets is is sort of on the decline. Uh, mm. 
goods goods tend to uh, uh, be cheaper, uh, more accessible in uh, countries where they have uh, existing trade relationships. And RCEP uh, is just another example of an ASEAN led. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Let's. I wanted to address that. Let's describe for our viewers what RCEP is. Uh, and it was just signed just a few days ago in Vietnam. So it stands for Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. In essence, it's a Chinese-led trade association. It's not that... Chinese, it's ASEAN-led. Well, okay, that, the Western press picks it up as being China, like because the United States is not a part of it, right? They're not, no. Yeah, okay, <laughs> all right, so ASEAN-led, but it includes Japan, it includes the Koreas, it includes Australia, New Zealand, and so forth. And at the moment, this is the largest trade association uh, in the world. It represents 30%. I guess it's more than, than the EU, yes, is what is. I was reading, in terms of its economic, because of China being the number two economy. Yeah. Um, so it was just signed. And this was perceived under the Obama administration as a counterbalance to the Trans-Pacific Partnership, or the TPP, which was immediately withdrawn from once Trump became president. That's one of the first things he did when he became president in January 2017. So anyway, sorry to interrupt you, Mark, but I just wanted to make sure that our, our viewers understood what RCEP is, because I don't think it's actually covered all that much in the, in the Western press. No, no, I, I don't think so. And, and that's, that's pretty typical, actually. Uh, the, if it doesn't impact the West, uh, why cover in the first place? But what, what my, what to, back to my earlier point, I, I, what I'm suggesting is that, that uh, RCEP uh, is a trend uh, towards connectivity uh, to China. And so as is the sort of Belt and Road Initiative that, that does support us to connect um, uh, the Silk Road or the Maritime Road to to, to China, uh, and uh, China looks at this as a sort of a uh, a restoration of Chinese hierarchy, a restoration of Chinese stature uh, in in the world. Uh, but I don't think that uh, RCEP is a uh, China led thing because uh, if it was Chinese led, I think you'd see a little bit more hesitance on the part of the Japanese to join. And you'd certainly get an instant refusal from India, who's only raised objections because of agricultural concerns. Yeah. Well, yeah. This, this issue of economic dependency and political reality yeah. is one that is clearly in Japan. And we've talked about this in many previous shows. So China is Japan's number one economic trading partner and has been that way for many, many, many years. But yet Japan, when it comes to political leadership, is you know, bolted together with the United States policy in general. Sure. So this creates this tension in countries in Asia and, and maybe worldwide, but anyway, our show's on Asia, about where do, what, what choice do you make? Do you want to continue to align with the number one military power, the number one political power, but not necessarily as strong economically as has historically been the case in the United States, or, you know, the growing economic opportunities of working with China and the fact that, like even New Zealand, Mark, New Zealand, China is New Zealand's number one economic trading partner right now, but yet New Zealand is a Western nation, so, so to speak, and would be more aligned with Western policies and so forth. So, this conflict is just deeply embedded in Asia, right? So that I think illustrates what these countries have to respond to in terms of this China, US or China Western uh, decision. You know, where, where do they align their, their allegiances? It sounds like Malaysia, Cambodia, and some countries are doing that. And yet in Japan, uh, you know, struggling with this. I, I think a, a really good example of what you're talking about is uh, Australia. So Australia, uh, um, in terms of economics, it is strongly tied uh, to China. So uh, it's heavily dependent upon uh, the Chinese to buy a, a lot of Australian products. Uh, it, um, its universities, uh, particularly, are funded um, mainly by Chinese students. 
right? Uh, so huge interconnectivity. So the, num the, the growing trend uh, for a second language in Australia, it used to be Japanese, but of course now it's, it's Mandarin. Uh, for, for Asian languages. And then the, the sort of the dichotomy here is that uh, Australia is also a part of the Quad. Uh, so this quadrilateral dialogue, which is aiming to sort of take on uh, Chinese aggression uh, in the Indo-Pacific region. So because of economic concerns uh, back in 2007, 2008, um, Australia sort of withdrew uh, from the Quad um, because of uh, uh, political concerns about uh, its dependence upon upon Chinese um, uh, markets um, and its dependence or its universities being uh, um, so connected uh, to 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 China. So, but as China became more aggressive and challenged um, um, uh, areas along what they call a, a, a gray zone. So there's sort, of, sort of like this uh, uh, gray line between war and peace. So it, it, it's taking its aggression to the point of, of outright conflict. Uh, it began to um, um, reassess itself in terms of its membership in the Quad. And the Quad um, is um, no longer sort of just an informal kind of dialogue. Um, there are what they call two plus two meetings being um, uh, taking place between India uh, and Japan. So the, the Ministry of Defense and Ministry of Foreign Affairs, so two plus two meetings, uh, things like that. Uh, mm -hmm. So you have a sort of formalization of the Quad as an institution, as a norm enforcing, um, post World War II order enforcing uh, kind of institution, uh, capable of challenging Chinese aggression in the South China Sea and in the wider uh, Indo Pacific. Mm. Okay. Yeah, it's interesting how this is all going to play out. Uh, speaking of Australia, <clears throat> this one article I found about the response of Asia to the Biden uh, election. Uh, this is from uh, Malcolm Turnbull, who was the prime minister when Trump won. He sent a text uh, to uh, Biden saying, what a relief that you won. So that's probably, that's not representative of the government, but it's a representative of the former prime minister. Yeah. But anyway, Mark, I, I took us on this economic discussion. You were about to talk about what the potential reaction to yeah. the Asia Pacific of the Asia Pacific region to the Biden election was I I, I stopped you there because I wanted to explain what RCEP was so please okay. if you could address that well, so the um, the re I, I I said before that the reaction isn't as important the reaction to his uh, win uh, his winning the election isn't as important as um, the potential for change and the the reality. The reality, based on uh, what has transpired over the last four years, basically um, U.S. absence from Asia altogether, but sort of a, a disengagement over the last four years, uh, that puts the United States uh, on the back foot. It puts the, the United States at a real, real disadvantage. Uh, so let me, let me give you um, an example. Uh, Hong Kong, right? Let's just talk about Hong Kong for a second, right? Despite the fact that there had been political protests uh, in 2014 and 2019, uh, a pro-democracy movement uh, uh, forming, uh, pro-democracy uh, legislators uh, in the, the Hong Kong special administrative region, right? And Chinese and the U.S. trade war going on, right? Um, a sort of vehemently anti-China and pro-Hong Kong stance taken by the Trump administration. They they didn't um, they didn't back China because um, or they didn't back Hong Kong because of human rights and de democratization concerns. They backed them for political reasons because there was a ch was a challenge to Chinese leadership, right? So. Now that there's this, this uh, Hong Kong security law, which was passed at the end of June of this year, which really dismantles uh, a lot of the freedoms, um, a lot of opportunities for democratic speech 
uh, in Hong Kong and ties down um, Western uh, influences, uh, Western companies' influences uh, in Hong Kong. All right. Plus, uh, just recently, they basically removed all the democratic legislatures, uh, le legislators uh, from the Hong Kong uh, LegCo. Right. So, what is Biden's what is Biden's uh, policy going to be towards Hong Kong? Nothing. Yeah. Nothing. Really? He can't do anything. That time is over. Right. So. Instead of using hard power strategies like, you know, a, a trade war or, you know, special punitive tariffs or, uh, you know, issuing what they call Magnitsky style sanctions where you sanction individual Chinese leaders, those are going to be incredibly ineffective, right? Because American companies and British companies and Western companies operating in Hong Kong are at, going to be at a, a significant disadvantage, right? They're going to be pressured to be tolerant of whatever policies China and Hong Kong put forward. So they're only going to be left with soft power strategies, which are incredibly limited, right? Like offering a pathway to citizenship. Um, the British government offered a pathway to citizenship for, for uh, British passport holders or people with Hong Kong passports. So perhaps to accommodate a growing sort of Hong Kong diaspora, right? But what's Biden's policy going to be towards Hong Kong? The same, because the options are, are um, essentially limited. The same with, with uh, Thailand. Um, the, the you don't think Biden will, will begin to at least acknowledge the democracy movement that you've written so much about? You, should, no, you just don't, don't see him doing that. I, I, of course, there, there, will be, there will be normative pressure, but... Uh, as um, I've written about before in, in, in academic articles, uh, normative pressure or democratic pressure, particularly that uh, uh, Obama put in um, after the coup d'etat in May of, of 2014 uh, was completely ineffective. It, it didn't do anything, right? It sort of solidifies or reinforces the idea that uh, Ch that Thailand has options and you know China being a, a significant option. So uh, Thailand can bend with the wind. It can, it can, it can navigate a sort of difficult uh, alliance between the United States and China. And uh, because it has options, you know, with China to its, its uh, uh, east, uh, can ignore all that uh, democratic pressure. Plus, since this is not just a, um, an internal democratic struggle, it is a struggle about Thailand's monarchy, right, which really controls um, uh, the levers of power in the country. Uh, this is not something the United States would want to get into because that is uh, going to be very, very contentious. They will stay dead quiet about that. It's absolutely too uh, controversial. Uh -oh. <clears throat> not a political. So you're, yeah, so you're saying the real politic on this is that even with the Biden ascension to the presidency there his his ability to influence asian democracy movements or other aspects of asian policy is somewhat limited because of That's choice point. there's no choice yeah. yes, exactly but because of choice the options are simply too limited uh, okay so all right let me let me stop you we have a question from okay. a from a viewer that came in Great. this has to do with reset so what should Biden do about this new ASEAN trade organization? Can he bring the United States in? Oh, that's an interesting question. Should he try to collaborate? What resistance would he have? So, Mark, do you think it's possible that uh, the United States would join RECIP? I mean, there's still the TPP still exists. The TPP, Japan is the yeah. leading member of that. Yeah. I guess maybe a more reasonable alternative would be the United States reengages with the TPP. Although my goodness, four yeah. years have been lost. Recep is a Recep is a is, is an ASEAN controlled um, trade agreement, and it would not definitely it would not uh, definitely um, include the United States. So there's no options there. Um, the the withdrawal from TPP in January of 2017 was catastrophic for the United States because it lost um, um, all of its cards in the game. Uh, and despite the, the urging from Japan, despite the urging from a lot of players or pro-U.S. players uh, in TPP, uh, was not able to, uh, to, to convince 
um, uh, Trump that 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 this is a, a strategic opportunity that has been missed. So regardless of what happens, um, uh, whether uh, Biden pivots back to Asia or whatever, um, there are no oppor opportunities for reset, but there might be for, for TPP. They might be able to re-engage in, in TPP. Um, this is... Uh, this is uh, a difficult scenario for the United States. Uh, it, there, there's no, um, there are no great options. Only, you know, sort of so-so options. Yeah. Okay, hey, hey, Mark, we're running out of time, but I, you kind of addressed this last the, question I have. And uh, you know, historically, you know, and I think of Carter administration as being the prime example of this. America did support democratic movements. Did want to spread the principles that we Americans like to believe right. that our country represents, you know, freedom and self-motivation and so forth. So yeah. certainly under Trump, that has all been cast aside because Trump really didn't care about all of that. Do you think, I guess there's two parts of this question that I'm not giving you much time to answer. Okay. Do you think given the political realities that you're describing here, the Biden would take this mantle back on again and say, we're a world leader, you know, we promote democracy. We understand that this is under threat in all over the world now. Yeah. Will they actually adopt that attitude? And then if they do, will it make any difference? So I know those are two very tough questions and we only have a couple of minutes. But what do you think? Yeah, so let me let me let me try to answer that for you. So Biden um, has promised to hold a kind of, uh, of summit on democracy uh, after uh, after January. But. Uh, I think that is uh, to, as you say, trying to assume the mantle uh, as a sort of beacon uh, for democracy, a supporter for democracy around the world. But uh, in terms of what it can do, um, uh, in terms of policy, is um, limited. Um, as I told you, like it's Hong Kong, very little options. Uh, interfering in, in, in Thailand's internal affairs, uh, a, a monarchical reform, uh, that's not something that any country would want to do. Uh, the, 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 the political pressure it can put on China in terms of uh, uh, human rights pressure when it comes to Uyghur Muslims um, in, in, in China's West, uh, that won't change. Um, I don't think that will change from Trump. Uh, Trump uh, uh, uses that as a uses that as a sort of a, a political weapon, as a sort of a instead of a sort of a normative tool uh for for diplomacy uh but uh i've just got to say it again uh, options for biden uh in terms of assuming the mantle uh for democratization uh which or democracy in general which has been in recession um basically since 2005 2003 um uh, are limited They're very very limited okay yeah. all right mark well uh, we're running out of time here. We're right up against it. Any closing statement? Uh, you know, it's kind of a negative message that you're bringing here that the world has become so complicated and maybe entrenched in a way that America's influence, even despite the four year vacuum that we've gone through here, let's say even if Clinton had won the election, uh, the role that the America can play in, in, in Asia, your message is basically it's somewhat limited. Yeah, well, this is the consequence of, of four years of, 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 of America first. This is a consequence of America's sort of lack. So it is of worse now. Yeah, it's, it's worse. You know, presidents are at best caretakers of, of, of American democracy uh, and at worst um, uh, dangerous. Uh, that could be dangerous uh, to, to um economies and political societies uh, around right. the world. And I think that sure. uh, Trump's um, America first um, anti-China policies have cost the United States uh, dearly in the West and uh, or in, in the East. And it will take Biden's entire four years to try to get the United States back on, uh, on course. And it's going to take at least eight or more to fix all of the damage. Uh, wow. It's just the reality. Well, on, on that wonderful <laughs> note, I think we have to wrap up. Thanks so much, Mark. We could easily go on for much, much longer. And of course. I'm going to invite you back on the show again as maybe we get further into the Biden administration and see what the early consequences are, if any, maybe six Sounds months from now. 
Thank you so much. Appreciate it.